All right, let me tell you about the Brooke Violin Concerto. It is peak romanticism. Oh, so glad we have this in our repertoire as violinists. So if you're listening to it, or better yet, learning this piece, you're about to be taken at least on three dates, probably have your heart broken, and go into a marriage across three movements. It is incredible. Now, known for its rich, seductive qualities, this piece is actually typically learned earlier in your violin education, but is actually one of the more difficult ones to master. And partially, that is because of its style of romanticism. So it's not the wear your heart on the sleeve style. It's think more Victorian era. You know, you got the fancy dresses, but you also have the, oh, I'm not going to tell anyone anything about my real emotions. I think anime tropes have this as well, where it's like, I'm not doing this because I like you or anything, because I just feel bad for you. So today we're going to watch a few soloists and check out their versions of the Brook Violin Concerto to see who pulls on our heartstrings the most. <laughs> Let's begin. All right, so first up we have Yehudi Menuhin. I'm feeling pretty excited. It almost feels like I'm going on a first date. Let's see what he does here in the first movement. Still very steely and I think less emotional at this point in the piece. I kind of imagine this to be like the opening is like, I'm still by myself, you know? You're still in like a single person mode. You're like, I'm very alone. You know, there's only one set of cutlery, one plate <laughs> in your pantry and you're by yourself for a very long time. This is what this gives me, these vibes. All right, so here's the next section where it's got this like rhythm and you're going somewhere. Wow, he starts up bow, what? Okay, maybe he's just having a bad day or something. That was crazy. Well, you know what? I've missed plenty of stuff in concerts before too, so let's just move on. Wow, why does he stut up bow? I'm gonna try that. Hmm. Oh, I see. Cause it's like, da da ta. So every time he's doing this. That's kind of cool actually. Look, these videos, I always love learning and taking from them inspiration and also little tips as well. Okay, let's move on to the next part. I want to hear the romantic part. I really love his vibrato. He has a beautiful, soulful vibrato, you know, in here. I just wish that he would have more direction here because, you know, this part, this section is a continuational line. A new thought occurred to me is we're using modern ears to listen to this, right? Which means that we've got so much more going on. Our retention is much less than I think people's was back in the day, right? We have less of an attention span. And what's happening is like, there's this need to feel like the phrase goes on, right? That we can also compute more information in less time. And so when there's this like sort of, I guess, expanded, our brains are perceiving it, at least mine is currently right now, as like, wow, this is really dragging and this is a little too slow. So I think that's a really interesting thought that I had just observed within myself as I'm listening to this. Anyway, let's move on to the next person. We've got Maxine Vengrov here uh, with the Brook Filing Concerto. Okay, so you can hear that there's more movement here. There's definitely, I think, a forward direction. Mm -hmm. 
This was the phrase I was talking about earlier that reaches for the top. Mm, very interesting. The way he plays it is very flighty. It's very free and you know that feeling where you're yearning for someone or something and you don't have it yet so you just sort of feel a little like restless. Yeah, he's got that here where it's like he's yearning. But instead of feeling like, ah, oh, I have it now, this would be what it would sound like. And said he's more like, okay, I'm gonna, I don't have it yet. It's a little bit more like he's bringing those emotions to the table. I really like that. All right, second movement. I like this a lot where how the way he uses vibrato. He's using the vibrato uh, in a very tactical way where certain notes he'll just like not vibrate in the beginning and then increase as the intensity of the, I guess the note does. Kind of this like more of a, he doesn't give it to you right away. And that's really cool. Yeah, so the third movement has this amazing intro that we're hearing right now. It's like building anticipation with the whole orchestra. It's so exciting every time. Super clean playing. So cool. And you can tell the orchestra is just enjoying every note as well. The third movement is one of my favorite third movements out there, along with the Brahms third movement as well. It's just got this like heroic person on a horse vibe, you know, that you sit up straighter when you're listening to it and it's like. I actually like mine a little bit crispier. I find that that it helps enhance that kind of old style militaristic feel to it. So that when you have the You get every note, you add even more to that kind of like, that vibe to it. Oh, it's so interesting. Oh, and also I just saw uh, in his description that he said he played this piece first when he was 12 years old and six years later made a recording with the Gavant House Orchestra and Kurt Mazur. And then by the time he was 21, nine years later after he first learned this piece, I decided I played this piece too much and left it for 24 years. Oh my goodness. Now I am very much in love with this piece again. I hope you will hear my love for the composer. Oh my gosh, that's actually wild. I mean, first off, it's wild that Vengrov had such a long career. He's, there's 24 years that have passed, right? Between him and playing this concerto. Secondly, he got sick of the concerto when he was only 21. But that being said, you know, love is often, I think, a complicated and messy affair, whether it be about music or especially with people. I mean, I would know, having been through that a few times myself, but you know what? I've often found that by channeling these emotions, the positive ones and even the negative and painful ones into music, it does help with the healing process, right? It does make you feel better. Actually, I've played some of my best concerts on nights that I didn't necessarily feel the best or the happiest. But the good news is that um, I've been working on a platform where you can share your emotions and be with a community of other people, and that's called Tonic. So in Tonic, you can open practice rooms, you can join others, get inspired by their playing, their practicing, and the best part about it is it's all free. You can meet other people as well. Who knows, you might even meet that special someone. So if this sounds uh, fun and appealing to you, then 
then definitely go check it out. Like I said, it's completely free and you can download it from the link in my description below. All right, so moving on, we've got Itzhak Perlman, also one of my favorite musicians. So many different interpretations you can see already. Wow, his is such a classic interpretation of it. It's so also like confident in this moment. Let's listen to some of the, I would say the vulnerable parts as well, but like just straight off the bat, you can hear that nothing is an issue here in his play. It's, it's just so good. Yeah, so, okay. Perlman has more of like a, his bow control is so steady. He uses the Dorothy delay method of just like having this very pulled sound. The vibrato is also very, I, I would say constant. But for me, it's like, I'm still thinking about Menuhin's vibrato, you know? It's still in my mind. I'm still thinking about that little more of the, So although Perlman is like perfect, I did use that word perfect. Somehow, when I think about the emotions and like love, what is love? What is love? I'm thinking about the ones that aren't as perfect, but do have like some kind of like soulful thing. Yeah, this, is, this being rock solid really feels really good. Wow. Okay. favorite third movement so far. Yeah. I think what we're learning is that one has to change. One has to be very different as much as you can be, be different characters, which I think is very, very difficult, right? On one hand to be like, to have like this like, vulnerable. To suddenly go to like this heroic. <laughs> But yeah, final person we have is Janine Jensen. Oh, Janine. Oh, I love her playing. Let's see what she does. Wow. So savage in the best way. Mm. She doesn't give up on the on each note. It's like the even in the the other players uh, are less sustained. She's more sustained here. But then she does this like incredible articulation in between the snap, like between the long legato notes. With this style of playing, you have to, you, you have a very small window to create that, that clarity. Oh, I wanna to listen to her playing some romantic parts. Yeah, you can hear all the different colors that she's doing, right? First of all, she starts, again, like more of like, similar to the Menuhin sound, a more flighty character. But then instead of leaning into it, like Perlman does here, she kind of does this like a hollow kind of warm sound. where she moves the bow a little faster, but, but then she develops the sound here and then backs away. Yeah, so a lot is going on when Yanin plays, which I love.
Nice. I, I feel like I heard a cough in there and I could see Yanine's eyes kind of flicker towards that distraction. And then she used it to like kind of, it, it, it sort of shook us out of the reverie so, and shook her out. And then so she like expanded and Right, and let's see how she continues. Mm. See how she does this like, it's like the wooly sound. I mean, I don't think I can even do it properly. I, I never use this sound as much as I should probably. If I'm trying to get a wooly sound, my sound goes like. I think I'm more of like the sound that has a, a little bit more density to it. I, d I try not to get too fluffy, but here it's, it's beautiful. Oh, I love that articulation. Also, the speed is pretty, pretty, pretty fast. Love it. Did you hear it? Did you hear? Oh, I love that. I love the articulation and the extremes that she does. Like you go from like one second, it's like ethereal. You can like only see it in the air. And then like you have these biting crisp notes. Oh, this is so incredible. Yeah, so there you have it. I mean, we went through four very different interpretations of the Brook Violin Concerto. And which one do you prefer? I don't know, I couldn't even say. But like, I do know that I love a different aspect of each performer. And I've always listened to music in this way where I think about it. I analyze it, I, I think about like why they're doing it, how they do it, and I wanted to share that with you today. So, hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to enjoy more of this style of content, definitely go check out some of the other videos I've made. We go into deep analysis of Sibelius, of Mendelssohn, of other concertos, and yeah, I'll see you in the next video, and don't forget to practice. Bye!